the DNA from the original project came from these three bones that were excavated from this cave, Vindia Cave in Croatia. They have been radiocarbon dated to about 38,000 years old, and they were the bones of hundreds of bones that we screened that had the best DNA preservation and the least amount of contamination from modern humans who uh, often touch these bones and leave their DNA on it and uh, screw up any kind of analysis that we might want to do. These three bones have been um, uh, nearly depleted now. This is, uh, DNA sampling is destructive. Uh, one must grind up the bone to get the DNA out of it. Um, and these bones were also um, recommended for this project because, as you can see, they're not morphologically very interesting. In fact, they were rescued from a box labeled cave bear bones by, <laughs> and there's nothing about them that would suggest otherwise. Um, which is what Svante was thinking when he went to the museum in Zagreb and said, can I have these bones too? Um, and uh, was uh, allowed to have them, and we sampled them on the chance that they might not be cave bear bones. They might actually be something more interesting, and they were, and um, at the time wound up being the nice, the, the best preserved bones that we had. Um, from that, from those three bones, we generated a little over one gigabase, one billion bases of uh, sequence data, and got a little bit of sequence data from some other bones that had DNA preserved in them, but just not as well. Um, and in total, had a little over one-fold coverage of the genome. So what that means, one-fold coverage, is on average, each position in the genome we see one time. But of course, these DNA fragments are just random pieces of the genome. So we're just getting random draws from some place in the genome. And many places we'll see twice. And some places we won't see at all. Some places we may even see more than twice. But on average, we have, or had at that time, 1.2 observations per position. Okay, so the, one of the first things that was interesting and, and rather unexpected was that when we analyzed the DNA sequences, the tens of millions of DNA sequences that come off of these machines, when we analyze them by comparing them against everything that's ever been sequenced before to ask, what is this? A very small percentage is similar to some primate DNA, like human DNA or gorilla or chimpanzee, and is putatively Neanderthal. More of the DNA, most of the DNA that we could classify by some sequence similarity, was similar to a soil living microbe, indicating that most of the DNA that we can get out of the bones is from something that colonized the bone while it was sitting in the ground for those tens of thousands of years. And furthermore, most of the sequences we couldn't classify at all by sequence similarity. And in retrospect, this is not so surprising because we know that most of the DNA sequence diversity out there in nature we've never seen before. If you go to a new place where you've never been and take a shovel for a, full of dirt and start sequencing the DNA that's in whatever's living in that dirt, mostly it'll be new stuff. We've hardly scratched the surface of diversity that exists in nature. So we think that's what this is. We kind of did go someplace we'd never been before and take a shovel full of dirt that happened to be associated with this bone and see a lot of things that we've never seen before. That is kind of an interesting anecdote, an interesting observation, but we don't care at all about those things. We care about these things. We care about the Neanderthal sequence. And in general, this, um, this fact is just an inconvenient thing that means we have to sequence a lot more than we would have to otherwise to get enough DNA from the Neanderthal to put together the genome. So, we concentrated first on the mitochondrial genome. The mitochondria is this short circular genome that is inherited only from one's mother, only maternally inherited. So everyone gets their mitochondria from their mother. If you are a boy, you have mitochondria and you need it in order to produce energy in the cell, but you won't pass it on to anyone. The mitochondria exists in each cell in about a thousand copies, depending on what the cell is, but it's in great excess over the nuclear genome. There are two copies of the nuclear genome in each cell, one that you got from mom and one that you got from dad. The mitochondria you only get from mom, and there are a thousand or so copies of it, and it's much smaller. This ratio of mitochondrial DNA to nuclear DNA, this shows up in the data that we get from this bone on the sequencer. We get a whole lot of mitochondria compared to the nuclear genome, and it's much smaller. So very early in the project, we were able to put all of the mitochondria together. It's a smaller assembly to make, and we have much higher coverage of it. 
Um, this process looks like this. So the consensus sequence that we infer is up here. It's probably hard to read the letters. A is um, green and C is blue and T is red and G is black. Those are the four bases of DNA. And each of these lines down here is one sequence read that we get. And doing assembly is a matter of aligning these all together and then inferring what the correct base must have been back when this Neanderthal was alive. And generally, the reads have the correct base at each position, but occasionally one will have something that's not the correct base. But if you have high enough coverage, you can see through this sporadic error to infer what the correct sequence was back when this guy was alive. Um, doing this uh, exercise revealed to us something that we kind of knew already from smaller scale PCR-based studies of ancient DNA, that cytosine deamination is the real um, process that is screwing us up often in ancient DNA. Cytosine, one of the four bases, um, will spontaneously deaminate and become a different base called uracil. When we read that uracil with the polymerase, with the little molecular machine we need to read DNA, we read this uracil as a thymidine. So what used to be a C is actually a U in the DNA, and this will be read as a T. So we oftentimes, where there used to be a C, will read a T. And this is a problem, obviously. If we want to know the right sequence of the Neanderthal, many of, um, of his Cs will be revealed to us as a T. Furthermore, we saw this um, interesting spatial pattern that if we asked how often you see a C to T difference, so we know that the correct base is C because we have really, really high coverage. But when we ask in individual reads, how often are we making that mistake that we know this is a C, but we read it as a T in that read? This rate is extremely high, nearly 40%, if that C happens to be the first position in that read, if it happens to be right there on the edge. And as you go towards the interior, this rate of C to T differences or cytosine deamination decreases to a background rate of about 2%. And we see the mirror image of this at the three prime end, the other side of the molecule, where G to A comes up uh, in, in uh, a mirror image profile to about 40% at the very last base. And um, we scratched our heads about this for months and um, kind of pieced it together what was going on that these ancient DNA fragments that we had always conceptualized as blunt-ended pieces, so DNA exists as two strands, the Watson Cran and the Crick strand, or um, however you want to call it, the plus and the minus strand. Um, we had always envisioned these as being blunt-ended, so each one of those strands ends at the same place. But in fact, we uh, know from these data and some further experiments that mostly they're not blunt-ended, double-stranded DNA. They often have these single-stranded overhangs. So the top strand will extend for a little ways that the bottom strand doesn't have, and likewise down here. And we also know that cytosine, spontaneous cytosine deamination, happens 100 times faster in single-stranded DNA than in double-stranded DNA. So this little edge that is overhanging here whatever cytosines are there are very likely to be deaminated. And this spatial pattern is really telling us what is the distribution of the lengths of these single-stranded overhangs? How long are they? There are 40% of the time at least one base pair and maybe uh, almost 30% of the time two base pairs and so forth down here. So what's going on on this other side? When we make this library, when we turn it into a molecule that we can actually sequence on the machine, we fill in this end here, we make a new copy that's templated off of this. So this position, if it was a cytosine that has been deaminated, what used to be opposite of this cytosine was a G. C base pairs with G. However, this cytosine is now deaminated to a uracil. That will be read as a T, and an A is opposite, put opposite a T, because A base pairs with T. So what used to be a G opposite a C is now put uh, an A opposite what kind of looks like a T. So we see exactly the same uh, spatial pattern. It's just the mirror image of the mutation. So this was kind of a fun puzzle to put together um, and interesting for that reason. But it also wound up being very, very useful for being able to accurately detect and align 
real Neanderthal sequences, when we know what error profile to look for in these sequences, then it's a, we can write a computer program that's much more sensitive for finding these and accurately aligning them against the human genome, knowing where we expect these uh, differences to occur. So um, we did that and uh, assembled the data. We, in the early days, were uh, really paranoid about contamination from human uh, humans who may have touched this bone, we get very little DNA out of the bones themselves and it's easy to pick up the bone and leave more of your own DNA on the bone than there is inside the bone. You will leave uh, many, many copies of your genome in this room when you leave tonight just from skin and hair and other things that we are shedding all the time. It, uh, a record of your presence will be here if someone is very um, careful about going to find it. Record of others' presence on these Neanderthal bones is a very inconvenient thing, and we, um, we screened these bones to make sure we were using ones that were free of contamination when they went into the sequencing, but we needed to design uh, uh, analyses that would make sure the data coming out were also free of contamination. One thing that we did that was very useful was we put together the mitochondria. The Neanderthal mitochondria has about 130 positions that are different from any mitochondria known in humans today. So positions where a Neanderthal is diagnostically different from any human who could have contaminated the bone. We can, using these positions, find just the reads that overlap them, these diagnostic positions, and count how many of these reads where we can tell that it's a Neanderthal or human, how many of them have the Neanderthal base, and how many of them have the human base. And those numbers wound up being about 27,000 having the Neanderthal base and 73 having the human base. So from that, we can infer contamination of less than 1%. We did another analysis looking at the Y chromosome. We were uh, lucky in a way in that the three bones that we had were all from female Neanderthals. So they were all from women Neanderthals. And therefore, there should not be any Y chromosome sequence in it at all. The Y chromosome is something that only exists in boys. It has the gene that makes one a boy. And these guys were all females. So any Y chromosome sequence, by definition, is contamination in our data. And out of the uh, many hundreds of thousands of reads that we had, four were my, uh, Y chromosome sequence. And from that, we can say what percent of the genome is Y chromosome and infer a contamination rate of also less than 1% from males. We also did uh, some things that I won't uh, explain in detail, but basically looking for positions on, in the nuclear genome on autosomes, non-sex chromosomes, that were fixed in all humans that we think are diagnostic for human versus Neanderthal. And because we had three Neanderthal bones, we could look at just two of them and find places where we think all humans have one thing and two of the Neanderthals have something that's different and then ask in that third Neanderthal, does that woman look like the other two or does it look like humans? And then switch out which one of the three Neanderthals is the third one and using kind of a complicated round robin strategy also infer a contamination rate of less than 1%. So from all of those consistent analyses, we infer that it's um, uh, a little less than 1% human DNA that we're looking at and uh, more than 99% Neanderthal DNA. So uh, starting to look at this, look at the, the actual data themselves and make sense of it biologically, um, uh, it occurs to me, I should take out my phone just to make sure I don't go long here. Okay, good. Um, we align the sequences, the short sequence reads that we get, um, with the chimpanzee genome and with the human genome. So if we do this, we know the correct phylogenetic relationship between chimpanzee, Neanderthal, and human is this, that Neanderthals and humans have a more recent common ancestor than chimpanzees and humans out here. So if we align sequence, chimpanzee, Neanderthal, and human, and count how many differences are there that are specific to the chimpanzee, or specific to the Neanderthal, or specific to the human. Remember, we have these three things. At each position, we have a chimpanzee, a Neanderthal, and a human base. We can see when it's a chimpanzee difference. We can also classify these by what the difference is. Is it a G to A, or an A to G, or a T to C? What is that difference? There's this um, very characteristic pattern of molecular evolution where these differences, they're called transitions, occur much more often than these differences, transversions. This is what we've come to know from molecular evolution, what happens. This kind of difference 
happens faster, and we see more of them in each of the three bones. We also see the same pattern, a very similar pattern, if the difference is in the human sequence. So if the Neanderthal and the chimp are the same and the human is different, we see this characteristic pattern of molecular evolution. We don't see that when the Neanderthal is different. If the human and the chimp are the same and the Neanderthal is different, there's a huge excess of G to A and C to T for the reasons that I just explained, that this is the characteristic base deamination that we see in Neanderthal data. We also see a huge excess of total number of differences in the Neanderthal branch compared to the human branch. And we know that the Neanderthal branch and the human branch ought to be roughly equal. If anything, the Neanderthal branch ought to be a little bit shorter because they have gone extinct sometime in the past, so they're missing some time to accumulate mutations. But in fact, we see this much longer branch. This is because the technology that we use is this single pass high throughput sequencing, and it results in a lot of sequencing errors. So this branch, the Neanderthal branch, things that are specific to the Neanderthal, is heavily enriched for sequencing errors. So at this, at this time, with the technology that we use to sequence one full coverage of the Neanderthal genome, everything that was specific to Neanderthals was, in fact, mostly sequencing error. So then you might ask, well, what good is it to uh, sequence Neanderthals in the first place if most of what you're seeing that's specific to them is error? Well, most of what is on this branch is not error. It looks like real molecular evolution. And how do we isolate this branch here? Well, we have to compare the Neanderthal to the chimpanzee to ask what is different, what is unique about humans, even with respect to Neanderthals. Of all the differences that separate humans and Neanderthals, all the differences between here and here, what are those special differences that are even unique with respect to Neanderthals? And now we can put our finger on those. And it's a much, much smaller number. And we can calculate what percent of differences are here compared to all the ones back here, and it's about 12.7%. What this means is if you take your favorite number for the common ancestor of chimpanzee and human, how long ago in the past did that guy live? A lot of people say about six and a half million years. If you take six and a half million years, then the, the time of the common ancestor average in the genome of human and Neanderthal is 12.7% of that or about 800,000 years. So we can use these data to ask how long ago in the past do we have a common ancestor with humans and Neanderthals? And this is uh, largely consistent with what we see from other uh, things in the fossil record.